Hello, folks. Jeff Salzman here, and welcome to The Daily Evolver. It's Thursday, October 26th, 2017. And today, I want to talk about what I see as sort of um, some new movement in the leading edge of society to try to integrate uh, voices that have uh, not been integrated so far. And uh, I'll sort of back up a little bit. And, um, you know, I, one of the themes of what I talk about a lot here on The Daily Evolver is that one of the great engines of evolution is defeat. Just seeing that the way you thought things were or, 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 or the way one should act uh, just doesn't work. And a year ago, <laughs> I was talking about how wonderful it was going to be because I think a year ago, it was a couple of weeks before the election, Hillary was, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 points ahead uh, in the polls. And, um, you know, we were going to see a resounding defeat of Trump and Trumpism. And they were going to get the opportunity, as defeated people have throughout history, to say what went wrong, you know, and do some introspection and find out what they've been missing and bring it in and move forward. Uh, but it turns out <laughs> that we liberals are the ones who are having to do that. And I, I, I will say that I'm happy to see that uh, we are. Uh, and I think Integral has a special way of doing that that is more complete. But uh, we see it happening in the mainstream and, you know, sort of an exit postmodernism, too. And today I want to go through four examples of what I'm seeing in just current culture. One is a, 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 a skit from Sarah Silverman. Uh, another is a column from the Daily Cause. Another is a, um, a little video on feminism from Vox.com, uh, which is uh, Ezra Klein's site. And the fourth is a column by David Brooks. So uh, let me just get going on this. Uh, the first one is a show by Sarah Silverman that she just launched on Hulu called I Love You America. So automatically you can begin to see that what she's trying to do and what a lot of people are feeling is how can we sort of go back to our traditional strata and bring forth a patriotism that can have some resonance with the nationalists that we see that, you know, or that in, in the nationalist impulse that brought Trump to power. And uh, so this is what she's trying to do here. So this is her show, I Love You America, and I'll play about a minute and a half where she goes and talks to Trump voters. So here we are. So let me see, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go to share screen. I'm going to go to, um, hang on. I'm going to start over. I'm going to go to share screen. I'm going to turn that off. Hang on. Here we go. Yep. All right. So do that. Go over here, do this. This is the first time we're doing this, but it's pretty fun. And I think uh, I'm going to learn it real quick. this show is to find something in common with people outside my little bubble. And this week, I'm headed to a random city in America to do just that. Now, I want to be spontaneous, so to decide where to go, I'm going to throw this dart at a map and see where fate takes me. Totally random city in America. Here we go. <laughs> I'm in Mineola, Texas, the mini areola of Texas, where 87% of the people voted for Trump. I'm here to meet the locals and see if we can find some common ground and undivide ourselves. Thank you for having me. You guys are firemen. Do you guys all own guns? Yes. Yes. 
You're not feeling like a stand your groundiness with me right now, are you? <laughs> no, 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 not by any means. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Obvious question. Who did you vote for and why? I voted for Trump. Why? I just knew that it was somebody different than what we've had before. And you voted for Trump, right? Oh, what, yeah. what did you like about him? Obviously, he's done well business-wise. <laughs> Gay marriage. Who's for it? Interesting, interesting. You guys, not for it. Go on. Not something I really care one way or another. That's what, that's what happens, happens. Then you are for it. I'm not for or against it. Doesn't matter to me. How about you, doll? Not for it or against it. Uh, haven't got a horse in that race, uh, so to speak. Would you speak out for somebody's right to get married if they're gay? I don't know that I'd speak out, as I've sat here quietly through most of this. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't affect your own sexuality. No, it does not. In any way. No, not in any So way. who gives a fuck? The people that are doing whatever they're doing, they have to answer to their higher power, whatever they think that may be. If Jesus came back, yeah. because he's coming back, do you think you would believe him <laughs> that he was Jesus? If you believe in it, you'll know. You think you'll know? I will know. I'm Jesus. No, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, So, you know, I think a nice try in a way, but, uh, you know, they actually do give a fuck. (laughs) And, um, And I thought the most interesting part of that piece was when he said, I'll know when Jesus comes back. And he, that was the most authentic moment in the whole thing. Cause aside from that hairdresser, God bless her. These people are pretty nervous. And you see that, you know, when she goes on, she talks about climate change and, and they don't believe in it. And then she tells them about the 95% of the scientists who do and so forth. And uh, it's not so much really about listening to them, honestly. And, um, and in terms of the, 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 the gay marriage thing, What you're seeing here and what you just witnessed was, you know, a certain progress. The the people who are against it, and you can bet that they are a little less equivocal when they're on their own and not on television. Uh, And and even the people who are for it, there's a half-raised hand. You see that, you know, that is defeated. Uh, In that way, uh, culture has moved forward. And this is where challenging uh, a point of view, not just empathizing with it. And that's, you know, we're always, there's a polarity in relationship in general, where we cooperate and we compete, where we challenge each other and where we empathize and love each other. And, uh, you know, both of them have to be in play here as we deal with our political opposition. Now, for most people at postmodernity, it's all about challenge and demonizing and vilifying, just as it is from traditionalists towards postmodernists. But at Integral, we want to bring that love piece in. I think she tried. Uh, at the end, she does this uh, segment where she says, okay, let's stop talking about red states and blue states and start talking about brown states. And then she has them all share about a time when they, as she put it, shit their pants. And I found it quite cringeworthy. It's on there. You can see it. It's on Hulu. Uh, everybody was a good sport. Uh, and they seemed to, it, it was pretty cringeworthy. But uh, so I got to say, when I heard Sarah Silverman was doing I Love You America, I was pretty excited because I find her to be, have an integral sensibility a lot of the time. And um, she was on the HBO show Crashing, which is a half hour comedy about a comedian who's crashing. And she plays one of his friends. And the advice she gives him is so beautiful and so, in my opinion, integral. I'll actually find it and play that for you uh, to sort of uh, show the sort of integral side to rehabilitate her because I don't think this show, I hope she finds her feet, uh, but I don't think that really did it. Okay, next is a column from the Daily Cause written by one of their columnists, Bob Burnett. And he went to a group Uh, in Berkeley, where he lives, uh, in a two-hour discussion on reaching out to Trump voters. And it was his um, uh, uh, group is uh, called Indivisible. 
which was founded on two primary values, as he writes. One is inclusivity and the other is nonviolence. And so they, um, uh, as he put it, many progressives after November 8th were dismayed to learn that one or more of their members of their family had voted for Donald Trump. It wasn't some random Republican in a remote red state. It was someone they had shared holidays and vacations with. It was a beloved member of the family. So he's talking about this meeting where they met with two UC professors, one Arlie Hothschild, and the other is George Lakoff. And George Lakoff is I regarded very highly regarded by many people in the integral community. And I actually don't know a lot about him, but I was interested because, you know, he is respected in the integral community to see, you know, what went on here at this big two hour meeting in Berkeley. Uh, I just want to read one more sentence before I get into the, um, the meat of it. And this is again, Bob Burnett and he's writing, he said, reaching out to a Trump voter is a reflection of inclusivity. That's good including everyone in the conversation. Every voter, regardless of their gender, race, ethnicity, sexual preference, or how they voted on November 8th. And that's, that's I think, great movement forward because generally Green has the idea, the postmodern worldview, that everybody's included, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, sexual preference, et cetera, as long as they agree with me. And so to include people who voted for Trump on November 8th is really broadening that definition. So uh, Bob Burnett came up with what he considered to be the seven key points that uh, Hothschild and George Lakoff, Lakoff made. So this is secondhand from Lakoff, uh, and um, I'll, I'll comment on some of it. So the first point that he came up with of these seven points was to listen. He said, Trump voters expect liberals to disrespect them. Therefore, no matter how outrageous Uncle Al's statement may be, listen and perhaps comment, I'm interested that you think that. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm interested that you think that is something that you show don't tell to use the expression, artistic expression. If you're really interested, you don't just say I'm interested, you follow up with questions. You respond back uh, in a way that lets them know you understood. This is basically couples therapy. When you have a couple at odds, the standard practice is to have one person state their point of view and make the other one restate that point of view to the first person's satisfaction so that they know you understood. And this is just one of these magical principles of communication that if you let another person know that you really heard what they have to say, then you can answer back anything you want and they'll hear you. They'll, they'll more likely hear you. People can't resist other people being curious about them. So I'm interested that you think that has just a little hand in it, a little back off hand in it. I guess it depends on how you say it. Okay, number two, um, do not insult Trump. Uh, Hotchild and Lakoff's writings make it clear that Trump voters identify with Trump. There's, I think that's true. To them, he's successful, politically incorrect, and a guy who has beaten the system. When they say something positive about Trump, reply, I hear what you say, but I'm worried about corruption and safety. Corruption because Trump will not reveal his tax returns and safety because of his ties to Russia. What do you think? So this is the instruction of what you say when they talk about positively about Trump. Um, again, listen. I mean, you don't come back with your, uh, you know, talking about of it. And two, when, when, you know, when Trump voters are concerned about corruption, the corruption they're concerned about is the corruption of the culture of their culture that, that you know, their parents and grandparents lived in and, and your mass media, you liberals, and your out of control immigration and your porn and your sexualization and your video games are corrupting the culture. So maybe listen about that with their corruption, you know, and safety. So again, I think that misses the mark. Next, um, clarify your own values. 
Trump voters have different values from liberals. Before you talk to Uncle Al, be clear about your own values. For example, do you believe that we are, quote, our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper, unquote? Search for common ground. For example, does the Trump voter believe in, quote, the golden rule? How does that uh, apply to, to people of color? George Lakoff's Lakoff suggests we ask Uncle Al, what actions are you most proud of? All right, so um, I, I like this one. Um, I think that last statement from Lakoff is to ask Uncle Al, what actions are you most proud of? And then really listen and really absorb. That is a gift of generosity to Uncle Al. And you are going to have a um, more... Uh, you're going to have a better relationship with Uncle Al after that. So I, 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 I give him points for that one. Four, recognize worldview. Oh, goody. Trump voters see the world as an elaborate hierarchy with rich American, white, straight, Christian guys at the top. Nonetheless, most Americans cherish the myth of the, quote, little guy who started out with nothing and fought his way to the top. Search for common ground in the concept of fairness. Everyone deserves a chance. Um, when I first read that they were talking about how Trump voters see the world as a hierarchy with rich American, white, straight Christian guys at the top, I was going to say, you know, there you go, vilifying, demonizing. But actually, it's true. <laughs> they do think that. Uh, and um, and they, uh, if you dig a little deeper, especially among the ones who really think about it, what they think is that white Christian culture is the culture that has brought modernity and, you know, all of the fruits of modernity to the world. Uh, you know, that Judeo-Christian thing was what informed Europe and, of course, the, the horrors of the Middle Ages and all of that. But, you know, Europe was the first to, you know, bring in modernity both in terms of the philosophy and in terms of the industrial revolution, technology, science, and all that sort of thing. And, you know, it has nothing to do with race. Uh, and there's a whole show in how different races have brought different stages of development into the world. But uh, it is, uh, if we look through a lot of what we see as racism, as postmodernists, what we see is that these are people who are actually happy to have a Ben Carson. You know, they're actually happy to have people of different races and creeds and colors and all of that stuff, as long as they agree with them. You know, who knew? This is multi, this is mono perspectivalism at work. So, um, you know, I think we can understand that a little more deeply, but it's true what they're saying here about how they see the world. All right, next, be careful about climate change. Most Trump voters do not believe in global climate change. Rather than take on this issue in general, talk about a specific local issue, such as contaminated drinking water. Say, I believe we should protect our children for con from contaminated water. Don't you agree? I, really? Of course they agree with that. And this is another misunderstanding of, of post-modernity in terms of understanding traditionalists and modernists even. Uh, climate change is understood by the leading edge uh, is um, a world-centric problem. It's, it's humanity bumping up the lim against the limits of the last finite system, which is the planet. Uh, what modernity has done every step of the way in various communities and countries is they've cleaned up the water. I mean, yes, there's the Flint, Michigan, and there's, there's other cases. But by and large, when you look at where America was, even when I moved to Denver back in the late 70s, we had a brown cloud that we were famous for. When I grew up in, in Youngstown in Pittsburgh, uh, the rivers, you wouldn't want, you'd never let your kids get near those rivers or the Great Lakes. They're all cleaned up. Modernity cleans up its own backyard. You can see that happening in China. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily come from a world-centric view. Only the world-centric view makes that problem global. Uh, locally, people handle it. So there's a distinction there. Next, be careful about race, ethnicity, and national origin. 
Many Trump voters live in segregated communities and do not know immigrants or have social contacts with people of color. Search for common ground by referring to the golden rule. What would Jesus do, ask them, if he saw a black man being beaten by the police? Well, this is such a litmus test. I mean, it's just so interesting. Uh, what a traditionalist would probably think if they saw a black man being beaten by the police is, thank God the police are protecting us. And they might be right. Maybe the policeman is subduing a criminal. Uh, that's the way the right would see that, just reflexively. The left would see police brutality and racism. And the bigger truth is there are plenty of both. And it's a Rorschach test. Uh, so, you know, listen and hear what they might have to say about that. It, it, it's the, I think, a good uh, advice. Okay, take seven. Take back patriotic symbols. Search for common ground using the symbols of patriotism, the flag, the constitution, and love of country. You can say, I'm reaching out to you because I love you and I love America. And I think that is right on too. I uh, give points for that one. Uh, and that gets us uh, to the next one I wanted to share. And this is from a video that was put out on Vox, V-O-X. And Vox is an interesting site. I've, I've always thought it had a sort of a proto-integral sensibility. It definitely prides itself on uh, uh, going up against the um, sort of mono perspective of, of post-modernity. Uh, it's, it's always trying to come up with a contrarian view or often. Uh, I see that less now, but at any rate, this is a really interesting a video. It's done by a young journalist uh, of some renown in her, I think, late 20s, Liz Plank. And it's a series of videos called The Divided States of Women. And this is a segment, and I'm going to play all three minutes of it, uh, actually three minutes of a probably an eight or nine minute uh, video, where she goes to a convention of young conservative women. Okay, and she, because she wants to do this thing that we all feel like we need to do, and that is reach out and find out and learn. So here we go. And I need to push this button. Feminism has always meant the belief in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. We're used to seeing progressives proudly identify with the movement. But now feminism seems to be trending amongst a group of women who have not traditionally been associated with the movement conservative women. I do label myself a feminist, and, and I think of that in, in very broad terms. I believe that a feminist is any woman who lives the life she chooses. I would tell my three daughters, the job for first female president of the United States remains open, so go for it. <laughs> I mean, if women who traditionally didn't embrace feminism are suddenly owning it, what exactly do they think feminism is? I needed to find out. So I went to Dallas, Texas, to a young women's conservative conference organized by Turning Point USA. Did you guys all just meet right now? Like a minute ago, yeah. yeah. Are you BFFs? <laughs> now we are. Yeah. yeah. As I talked to these young conservative women, I realized that surprisingly many of them identified as feminists. Ivanka identifies as a feminist. Do you identify as a feminist? For sure. Absolutely. Carly Fiorina has said, you know, feminism is what you choose to do with your life as a woman. I actually am a conservative feminist. I do consider myself a feminist. This is my feminism. These are my feminists. This is my feminist movement. I don't believe there's a glass ceiling. I think that the wage gap is a myth. There's nothing planned about Planned Parenthood. It really needs a new name. My frustration with abortion is that I think people are just using it as a form of birth control. Modern feminism, I don't identify with as much. I mean, I attended the Women's March. I marched with a sign that says, Gun Save Lives. And I mean, I was spit on and yelled at and screamed at. We're kind of not considered feminists just for being conservative. I want to know that that movement is open mm. to conservative women. All this whole divisiveness that the media has created, if we were to just like sit down and just have a conversation. Conservative women feel left out because of their political beliefs. But throughout history, many women have been left out 
just because of who they are. Even women who have had crucial roles in the history of the movement have been excluded from the mainstream feminist recipe. Feminists in the Kitchen, voluntarily. Joining me today is celebrity guest Akila Hughes. Mass-produced mainstream feminism recipes always include your basic ingredients. The suffragette movement, Rosie the Riveter, Lena Dedham's liberal use of skorts. But even when discussing those parts of feminism, key ingredients are then pushed to the side and their roles marginalized, leading people to conclude that there are only a handful of things in feminism, but there is so much more. Okay, now watch what happens when you add a little Sojourner Truth to the mix. It's going to give you that early abolitionist women's rights universal suffrage base that all the other ingredients then build off of. Now you're going to want to sprinkle in some uh, Marsha P. Johnson mm. all over this thing. She's mm. the African-American trans woman who reportedly threw the first brick at the Stonewall rights. Yes. She's essential to the recipe. And yet somehow people are still pretending you can make feminism without her. Can you imagine leaving all this good shit out? That's crazy. When my mom used to make feminism when I was a kid, my favorite part was Sylvia Rivera, mm. who founded STAR, a group dedicated to helping homeless young drag queens and trans women of color. Why would anyone leave that out? Uh, because of systemic racism, homophobia, and trans misogyny. So to bind this all together, in 1989, legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality. You literally cannot make feminism without it. I've had feminism without that, and it tasted like trash. Trash! There's just so much in feminism. Luckily, we've got a feminism ready to enjoy. feminism I've ever had. I know, that's why I keep telling everyone. Thanks for joining me, Akila. And thanks for watching Feminists in the Kitchen, voluntarily. <laughs> Although feminism is being embraced by more people, it's important to make sure that it doesn't get devoid of its meaning and mission. Just like Audre Lorde once said, it is not our differences that divide us, it's our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. All right. So um, <laughs> that was uh, interesting. Um, so they go to the conservative conference. They talk to some conservative women who talk about guns save lives and uh, glass ceiling is a myth and that uh, abortion is problematic because people use it for birth control. And these are conservative positions. And, uh, and then they go to a skit where they, I don't know if they're trying to metabolize what they just saw or have any relationship with it, but they point out that uh, there has been a whole bunch of people who've been left out of feminism, but they're not the people on the right uh, that, or the women on the right uh, who, who, you know, Carly Fiorita, there's a whole bunch of them who actually are feminists who actually believe in the equality of women or the, and the ability of women to, as Carly Fiorina put it, choose whatever life you want to live. That's feminism. And, you know, it's hard to argue with that, but fair enough. What they're doing is they're adding the, the women on the left who have been left out and they bring up three people, Sojourner Truth, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, uh, two of which are trans women uh, one of which who was in Stonewall, the other which started a group dedicated for drag queens and trans women. And they add that. So that's, uh, you know, broadening the field. And I think those people ought to be uh, part of the cake, you know, baked into the cake too. Uh, but it's not responsive to what we had just seen and what was, um, you know, the theme of this video. And then they end with this thing again that is so misunderstood uh, that she says, as more people embrace feminism, it's important that it doesn't get devoid of our meaning and mission. And then she quotes this quote, and this is the thing that sums it all up. It's not our differences that divide us, but the inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. But there was no celebration of the feminists who believe that guns save lives. So, uh, and I'm not sure there can be. Uh, this is, um, you know, one of the uh, sort of challenges that uh, at some point I get kind of confused with it all too. And I think there's uh, a, a stage where we're consciously incompetent. And, you know, before, the previous to conscious incompetence is just unconscious incompetence. 
And that's bad. That's just ignorance. But now we're sort of, you know, these people, all of these that we just showed are people who really know that, that they are incompetent in understanding their political opponents. And they're tr trying to work on that, but they just <laughs> don't like them. And they don't like anything that they think. And so they're, you know, struggling like a little baby trying to find his feet to sort of sort it all out. And I think it's just, I mean, if I'm all for it, you know, this is right on schedule. This is green realizing that it's time to move on, that there, 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 there was too limited. There's an echo chamber and uh, it's a first stab at true integral multi-perspectivalism, what we're seeing here. But it's, uh, these are pretty, uh, you know, they're not, they're, 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 they're not that successful stab yet, but fair enough, we're moving forward. And then finally, I want to share a little bit from a column from David Brooks. And I think here David Brooks hits, does hit the mark. And Brooks is interesting. A lot of people in the integral community pay attention to David Brooks. He's, of course, the uh, uh, op-ed columnist weekly for the New York Times. So he's sitting in a very highly influential position in the culture. And he often has sort of just short of integral views. It's sort of frustrating to read him sometimes. But here I think he actually hit the head, hit the nail in the head. And this is a column that he wrote a couple of days ago called How to Engage a Fanatic. And he starts out by talking about he had just done some travels. And uh, he went to a started out at a baseball game in, in, in Washington where he sat behind a guy who spent 10 minutes haranguing him, his wife, and his son for something. And so he, there was a fanatic at the baseball park, probably his politics. Uh, he talked about going to Madrid, where this, this big conflict between the Spanish and the Catalans about independence for Barcelona and the Catalans. And then he talked about going to a campus in North Carolina where there's this, he sat in this really heartfelt discussion on whether and how to allow extremists to speak on campus. He talked about traveling to England and hearing a fight between the Brexit and the anti-Brexit people. And um, so here's what he writes about that. He, he, first of all, he writes about, you know, there's, there's certainly an argument that at some point, uh, you know, racist views and so forth just have to not be tolerated. And that you, you know, there's an argument for that and that, you know, civility is not a suicide pact, as he puts it. Um, but then he says on further reflection, and here's where I'll see if I could share the screen again. Um, Oops, there we go. Is that up, Corey? Yep, I can see yeah, it. Yeah, cool. All right, so here's what he says. And I, I really love this. I think he's right on. He says, the only way to really confront fanaticism, this is after he sort of entertains that other perspective. Oh, Jeff, I'm sorry. I think we're actually looking at your notes for the show right now. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. Okay, tab, so maybe? We got, yeah, let me um, stop that share and go back to um, put this screen share and how about that? Yep, I can see that. And just so everyone knows, this is what post-production is for. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so. But we're learning this. This is really going to be good to use stuff from the culture and to show it. And I'm Absolutely. really happy to be on our learning curve here, Corey. All right. So he, he writes, so finally, the only way to confront fanaticism is with love. Ask the fanatics genuine questions. Paraphrase what they say so they know they've been heard. Show some ultimate care for their destiny and soul even if you detest the words that come out of their mouths. Hallelujah. And he says, you engage fanaticism with love first for your own sake. If you succumb to the natural temptation to greet this anger with your own anger, you'll just spend your days consumed by bitterness and revenge. You'll be a worse person in all ways. 
And I think we can see that in uh, a lot of our friends and sometimes in ourselves uh, with this Trump era that it, it is, um, we're, we're, we're uh, 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 what he just said, consumed by bitterness and revenge. And um, so I think calling that out is good. If on the other hand, you fight your natural fight instinct, your natural tendency to use the rhetoric of silencing, and instead regard this person as one who is, in his twisted way, bringing you gifts, then you'll defeat a dark passion and replace it with a better passion. You'll teach the world something about you by the way you listen. You may even learn something, and I love this next part. A person doesn't have to be right to teach you some of the ways that you are wrong. I love that. And then um, he talks about second, you greet a fanatic with compassionate listening as a way to offer an unearned gift. I love that. An unearned gift to the fanatic himself. This is not about being fair. You know. These days, most fanatics, he writes, are not Nietzschean supermen. They are lonely and sad. Their fanaticism emerging from wounded pride, a feeling of not being seen. If you make these people feel heard, Maybe in some small way, you will address the emotional bile that is at the root of their political posture. And I think that's right on. I think that those of us in the, you know, modern and postmodern world thought that we could just move forward without, uh, you know, bringing the traditionalists into the party. And, uh, and they do feel left out. And, uh, and if you look at the culture not just the politics, but culture, uh, they are pretty much left out. So, um, you know, at least pop mass culture. And then finally, he writes, it's best to greet fanaticism with love for the sake of the country. We all swim in a common pool. You can shut bigots and haters out of your dining room or your fantasy football league. But when it comes to national political life, there's nowhere else to go. We have to deal with each other. Civility, Stephen L. Carter writes, is the sum of the many sacrifices we are called to make for the sake of living together. And I love that. I'll read that again. Civility is the sum of the many sacrifices we are called to make for the sake of living together. And then he goes on, he says, you don't have to like someone to love him. All you have to do is to imitate Martin Luther King who thrust his love into his enemies' hearts in a way that was aggressive, remorseless, and destabilizing. Mm. And I'll read that again. Imitate Martin Luther King, who thrust his love into his enemies' hearts in a way that was aggressive, remorseless, and destabilizing. And that's so true. I mean, you know, Martin Luther King has this sort of iconic uh, uh, status in our culture for a reason. And if you haven't read uh, his writing, uh, I mean, his speaking is amazing, and that's sort of in the sort of water. But his writing is exactly this. And it's, it's just, I mean, talk about love as, you know, a, a, a destabilizing force. A try letter from a Birmingham jail. All right. See you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot. I, I see there's a podcast called Conversations with People Who Hate Me that uh, is getting a lot of attention. And, you know, this is a guy who's trying the same thing. I may be able to take a listen and play some from that. But it's good to see the culture trying to do this. And I think, you know, some of the examples we used is uh, trying in sort of a ham-handed way. But, you know, I'm all for it. 